Thank you for listening to the History of the Papacy. I'm your host, Steve. I would definitely highly encourage it, and I think you'll enjoy it if you went and subscribed to my newly re-released Beyond the Big Screen. We have all new interviews and all new guests. It's really a fun show, and I think you'll enjoy it. You can find it on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. I definitely ask it if you're enjoying the history of the papacy and Beyond the Big Screen and or. You should definitely go over and subscribe to them on Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review. They really help us find out and me find out what you're liking about the show and what we can always do better. Now, um, we're back on Patreon, and there, of course, at Patreon, there's four tiers, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome, which all represent the earliest major bishoprics in the early church, and they carried through throughout much of the history of the church. Now, inclusion on the history of the papacy diptychs includes... Bonus audio, video content, Pope coin coming soon, monthly book drawings, and early ad free content, and much more for as little as 10 cents US a day. So if you want to be on the tops of the lists, it's only 50 cents a day. It's hard pressed to get anything this day and age for 50 cents a day, but you can get on the history of the papacy diptychs. Now, let us commemorate the Patreon patrons on the history of the papacy diptychs. We have Roberto, Yoren, William, Brian, Jeffrey, Christine. Christina, John, and Sarah at the Alexandria level, Doppo, Paul, Justin, and Lana, all of whom are magnificent at Constantinople and reaching that ultimate power and prestige, that of the Sea of Rome, we have Peter the Great. Today we're continuing our Summer of Scholars, or Winter of Wisdom, for our Southern Hemisphere friends. We are joined by Professor James Papandrea for part two of our exciting and wonderful conversation on the early church. We delve into ideas of where the Roman papacy came from. We talk about how the office of the bishop developed and much more. I hope you enjoy, and I look forward to talking to you again soon about the early church, the popes of Rome, all from the perspective of scholars straight from the academy. You're getting it right from the horse's mouth in this series, and there's going to be much more of it. Uh, So I thank you for listening, and I will talk to you soon. Before we move off from baptism, because there's a lot of other things to talk about, but baptism is such a key one. Now, it was just, there was a lot of people who did not, they held off their initiation, their baptism and all that until the very end of their lives. Was that a common occurrence or did most people want to, they got it done when they were ready to get it done and when their bishop told them or the, the local community leader said to get it done? I think most people would have been baptized as soon as they were ready, as soon as their, you know, their catechist and and their sponsors determined that they were ready. Um, And I think with children and infants, I think there was a sense in which you wanted to get them baptized as soon as possible because of, you know, fear of infant mortality and, and, and other reasons. But there were these cases um, and they're usually wealthy men and who they they postpone their baptism until their retirement because they know what a serious commitment baptism is and they simply don't want to have to live up to the ethical expectations of the church for a baptized christian until they're finished with their upwardly mobile career or their military career or you know finished being emperor um or for whatever reason and it's it's ironic because even some of the saints of the early church, and here I'm thinking of the Cappadocian fathers, um, Basil and the the Gregories, even some of those guys, when they were born, they were born into Christian families, but their fathers said, no, we will not have them baptized because I want them to be lawyers. (laughs) And so they, they were going to have a lucrative career as lawyers. Now, of course, in each of those cases, that career didn't pan out and they became, you know, uh, not only clergy, but monastics, but, um, but yeah, so in, in, 
among some of the wealthier classes, there was this sense of, well, you know, we'll, we'll get under the wire, you know, we'll get that baptism in right before heaven. But in the meantime, we have to have a lucrative career, or I have to be able to, you know, dispose of my enemies in uh, ways that the church wouldn't approve of or whatever, you know. How early is there evidence of infant baptism? Well, that's, yeah. So if you want to dist- make a distinction between infant baptism and and the baptism of children, that would be hard to say. Um, but we do have evidence of of whole households with children being baptized it, already in the New Testament. There's a couple of examples. Um, and, you know, I, I would argue, too, that you can see even in, in that great first sermon that St. Peter preaches in the book of Acts, um, and the, I mean, he finishes the sermon and the people are like, well, so what should we do? And he says, well, you need to get baptized. And he makes that comment that, that this is for you and your children. Now, you know, some people would interpret that as for you and your descendants, except remember, he's not expecting there are going to be very many descendants because he still thinks Jesus is coming back in his lifetime. So you have to interpret that as though even from the beginning, Peter expected the children were going to get baptized. Um, And so we see that already in the book of Acts. And then, um, you know, I think that the church has just always baptized um, children and infants. And it's interesting because, and I, I, off the top of my head, I can't point directly to a specific document, but you, you, you might think, oh, maybe there was a debate over this in the early church. Maybe the early Christians wondered, should we baptize infants? There was no debate over that. The only debate was, should we wait until the eighth day? In other words, a baby is born. Should we baptize that baby immediately, or should we wait until the eighth day and do like what the Jews do for circumcision? That was the argument. So, so there was no, you know, like nobody worried that infant baptism was a bad idea. It was being done. Um, I think it was probably being done from the beginning of the church. And so, you know, that may be one reason why we can't pinpoint, oh, when did they start doing this? They were always doing it. And would that have even been an issue that in the Roman times and um, with the Romans and the Greeks, that when the head of the the father of the family said, hey, we're all becoming Christians, it didn't matter. And that spread to not only the infants, but that was slaves and servants and patrons and anybody associated with the family. You're coming along, too. That's right. Whether you like it or you don't, but. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I mean, um, that's just one of the many reasons why it's fair to say that that the whole concept of conversion to Christianity was much more of a corporate thing than an individual thing in the early church. We are so conditioned by, well, I would say enlightenment, individualism, and and Protestant Reformation um, preaching in, intended to sort of convert by convincing the, the, you know, the individual mind. We're so conditioned by these things that we are used to thinking of, of the, the concept of becoming a Christian as a decision an individual would make. But in the early church, I mean, yeah, the, you know, individuals made that decision, but families made the decision. And as you say, the head of a household would make that decision for a whole extended family. Um, a, a king, I mean, you get a little later into the history, a king will make that decision for a whole kingdom, you know, so it's, um, it's much more of a group decision than we're used to thinking about. On the opposite side of that spectrum, you had mentioned in one of the videos, and this was something I didn't even, uh, had never even heard of, is baptism of d- people who were already dead. How a common of an occurrence was that? And in what context were baptisms of people who had already deceased happen? Well, the, the truth is we have no idea. Um, and, and this is one of the, re- that's one of the reasons why I brought it up in the video was to make a point that you, you can't read scripture in isolation because if you do, then you have this one verse in one of Paul's letters where he says, he makes mention of this practice of baptism for the dead. And that is, that is the last you ever hear about it. No one does it in the early church, as far as we can tell. It, it was a thing that existed briefly and went by the wayside. I don't even know why they would do it, except 
you know, if you if you think about Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, where there are Christians who were so um, sort of urgently looking for the return of Christ in their lifetime that if their loved one passed away, they worried that that person was going to miss out on the second coming. And Paul has to say, no, they're not going to miss out. They're going to they're 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 waiting for you. Right. Well, you know, perhaps people um, in catechesis passed away before getting baptized or something. And so they experimented with this idea of um, having someone else baptized for them, which is what the the text in in Paul seems to imply. Um, But then we never hear about it again. Um, And so, so my point in even bringing it up is, you know, the New Testament is great. It's the word of God. It's inspired. It's infallible. But you can't read it without also knowing about the early church, because otherwise you're going to misinterpret it. Yeah, that's so interesting, because you do have people who would be interested in the, be, either becoming a Christian, and maybe they, like you said, they just suddenly up and out of nowhere die. People want answers for that, but also people who are Christians already, but then die maybe in some sort of condition where they're outside of the church or they're not exactly, um, I mean, the phraseology has changed quite a bit over the time, but maybe they're um, not able to take communion. Like they're in a hearer situation where you're on the other side of the of the curtain. So there's there's obviously a lot of practical issues there that come up. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And the church did develop a practice of, you know, if someone is in, um, you know, sort of doing penance and they haven't been reconciled to the church, but then they, you know, they get sick and death is imminent, then, you know, the bishop or a priest will go out and reconcile them immediately just so that they will, you know, die in, in the grace of the church. But, um, but you no, know, this, this baptism for the dead thing never, never caught on. You know, that's another interesting thing is that you get in your mind with that if you're not in communion for some reason, then you're just out. But fairly much the expectation in the church was that if you weren't able to take communion, you still had to come until you worked your way back in to a state of a, a grace, if you will, or some sort of... Um, positive value to being in the church were there conditions even in the early church where you couldn't make it up for what you had done you're just out like anathema type situation well there is a lot of debate over this exact question in the early church and um and i mean i want to say first uh up front just keep in mind that you know penance is never really about making up for sin because there's really no way we can make up for our sin. We, you know, we don't sort of earn merit by doing penance that makes up for our sin. Penance was always about demonstrating the sincerity of your repentance, right? So if the bishop says to you, well, you're going to spend the next seven weeks as a hearer. Yeah, you better show up. You you do you can't be like you know go fishing on Sunday morning because you're like, well, what's the point? No, yeah, you, that's how you're going to demonstrate the sincerity of your repentance so that you will be reconciled at the end of that time period. But there were debates over what is the unforgivable sin? What uh, you know, what sins are the worst mortal sins? What sins can or cannot be forgiven by the church? Um and a lot of that debate comes to a kind of um, crucial point uh, in the aftermath of persecutions in the third century when uh, a lot of Christians, to save their lives or to save their jobs or whatever it was, they, uh, they made pagan sacrifices and some even denied the faith. And so, you know, when the emperor said in the middle of the third century, he said, you know, everyone in the empire has to make a sacrifice to prove their patriotism, their loyalty to the emperor. Well, Christians, a lot of Christians just lined up and figured, well, you know, God knows my heart. God knows that I don't really believe in these fake gods, but I'm going to, you know, cross my fingers behind my back, throw a pinch of incense on the altar and move on with my life. But the problem is, is that they did that and then showed up for mass the next Sunday 
And, you know, the ushers are like, oh, no, who do you think you are coming back? I here? saw you there. <laughs> we know what you did. So then the question becomes, how can they be reconciled after committing apostasy and idolatry? Can they be reconciled at all? What consequences will there be? What, you know, and, and this really is the point at which our sacrament of, of confession and reconciliation became kind of standardized in the church um, because they, you know, there was, of course, there were people who, who wanted to just let them back in with no consequences. That was mostly them. Um, there were people who wanted to excommunicate them for good and say, no, you're out forever. You're done. And the church, of course, took a kind of middle way. Uh, we will reconcile you, but not without consequences. And so, you know, the structure of penance gets kind of standardized and formalized. And um, but, but yeah, it's a huge debate uh, over all this, in the, especially in the third century. I think all of these things kind of add up to th the big issue of the early church and how the clergy was structured. And the big one that comes up first is the bishop. Who was the bishop? And I think inside of bishop is this loaded term of bishop. And like so many uh, words that we get down from English after 2,000 odd years that have passed from Greek to Latin to early French to middle French, and then they wind up in, in modern English. The, it it kind of gets a little um, uh, kind of like that telephone game. You kind of, it gets lost the message a little bit. What was the very earliest bishop? Yeah, well, you know, you, you make a great point that when we say the word bishop, B-I-S-H-O-P, you know, that's an English word, which obviously the early Christians didn't use that word. They had a word, but the problem is, is that that word kind of shifts in meaning over the course of the first century. Now, I go into detail uh, on this on uh, my video, did the original church have bishops? But, um, but the, you know, the short answer is that the first bishops are really the apostles. They weren't called bishops, but that's how they functioned, because they had regional authority over multiple, let's call them pastors, right? Um, over, over the course of that first century, though, the, what we might call the office of bishop evolves into a citywide office. At, you know, we think of a diocese or we think of, you know, a bishop as sort of the overseer of a city. And that is kind of how it developed in the first century. Um, but remember, if there's only one congregation in a city, well, the priest of that congregation is also the bishop by default. So you have this situation in the first century where the, the concepts of priest and bishop overlap or are almost synonymous. And then eventually when the apostles pass away or are martyred, then the office of bishop emerges as a, as a distinct office to sort of replace the apostles who are now gone. So, you know, on the one hand, you could say that the first bishops are the apostles, but in another sense, the first bishops are the disciples of the apostles, the, the you know, the, the men, the apostles chose to succeed them. And so this is why we think to this day of the bishops of the church as the successors of the apostles. Their, their power kind of spreads out um, top to bottom where the bishop, he has authority that goes back to an apostle or maybe from him to a teacher to an apostle, depending on where you're at in history. And so... Uh, it's pretty easy, like if it's a city like Rome, right in the beginning, where there's one one congregation and there's one leader, and that's the bishop. But when it starts to get into more than one congregation, because I mean, you're you have a house church, there's a limited size. It just practicality speaking, and so you're going to have to go to a, a another congregation. Was that one bishop? I mean, how much do we know? Was that one bishop in control of, say, a, a, we have a, a theoretical city that has two congregations now? Was he the leader? And on one Sunday, I'm going to go to this church on this side of town. And, that, and when I'm not at this other church, I'll have my somebody filling in for me who I'm giving my authority to. And then, so I'm just going to flip flop and forth. And when a new congregation opens up on the south side of town, I'm going to kind of do the same thing. Was that kind of, was that how that power was kind of evolving out? 
Well, you know, we we probably have to admit that um, it would have happened different ways in different places. It, it's it would not be the same across the board. So in one city, you may have a situation where exactly that, where um, the congr the you know the number of Christians in the city grows to the point where now we're going to split into two house churches, and uh, up until that point, there's been only one priest, and so you know, that, that priest says, okay, well, you know, uh, I'm going to be at Bob's house, uh, for liturgy at, at 5 PM and I'm going to be at Bill's house at 7 PM. You know, that's entirely possible. It's also possible that in other places when, you know, when one congregation splits into two, uh, a priest, a new priest is chosen for the, you know, the other congregation. Now, once that happens, one of those two is still going to be kind of like the bishop with authority over the other one, usually because the one with authority knew the apostle personally, learned from the apostle, or there's some kind of succession there. Um, and so it may be in some places that if there's two congregations with two priests, it may be that the one priest who has authority will actually consecrate the sacramental elements for both churches, and then a deacon or a runner or someone will take some of those consecrated elements to the other house. Uh, it may have happened that way. Um, and so, you know, you can probably imagine other scenarios too, as, uh, as the church grows and sort of finds its way into a standardized way of doing this. So really, because the priest isn't mentioned directly in any of the new testament documents or at least in the gospels so that's a kind of a position that evolved out of the bishop's role well in the new testament you know you you have these two words uh one word we usually translate bishop and the other word we usually translate priest but the problem is is that in the new testament they're used interchangeably to refer to the same person and the same office so it's like the way we might use um priest and pastor, right? Uh, or the way uh, Protestants might say pastor and minister or something like that. You know, the words can be used interchangeably. And so it's tricky when you look at the New Testament because you can't say, oh, here's the word for bishop and then over here's the word for priest. And that's two different things. It's probably not two different things. And so, uh, so it, you have to know that when you interpret these New Testament texts. And now a word from our sponsors. How early, I know, a person, Andrew, he's a friend of mine and a, he's also a podcaster, but he had a question about how did the archbishop or the bishop of bishop of bishops, when did that come along and where did that kind of grow out of? Well, it, 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 it kind of develops naturally. And so if you think about um, the apostles who themselves started churches or, you know, they were sort of the first or only apostle on site in a particular church. You know, you can say, you can put Paul in Corinth or, you know, in Greece, you can put Mark in Alexandria, you can put Peter in Rome, right? So they, from the beginning, those guys are going to be like archbishops because even if there's someone else uh, you know, in a, in a nearby city, they would have to defer to these apostles. Um, over time, the larger cities grow to have a kind of authority over the smaller cities around them. And so whoever the Bishop of Rome is, whoever the Bishop of Alexandria is, um, whoever the Bishop of Antioch is, right, is going to have a certain measure of authority over the smaller cities around them simply because they're in this line of succession going back to these important apostles. Um, and so it, it develops early in a sense, but then the, the actual authority and the actual power develops as well. So that eventually even, you know, let's say if, if a city outside of Rome wants to elect a new bishop, the Bishop of Rome will have veto power over that election, right? And so these kinds of these kinds of authorities develop over time. 
Yeah, I think that that's what's so interesting is in so many of these cases, things on the surface seem to be very similar and very homogenized. But then when you start to drill down closer into more localities, then a lot of the commonalities break down or there's a lot more regional variation than what the the very big picture kind of says. Yeah, that's right. And it's very interesting because the early church was very tolerant of, you know, variations or diversities in terms of um, devotional practices and even liturgy to a certain extent, um, but not so much when it came to doctrine, right? So um, there was a sense from the very beginning that we all have to be on the same page doctrinally, and uh, we have to be clear about the doctrines. And um, so there, so there was not that tolerance of diversity in doctrine. And there, you know, there's a myth that um, gets perpetuated by even scholars some, sometimes that, you know, that in the early church, there were, there were many different theologies, many different Christologies, and they were all sort of equally valid. Well, that is not true. And if you, if you do the homework and you read the documents, you'll see that that was not true, um, that it was important to the apostles and their successors that people believe the right things about Christ. Because if you don't, if you believe the wrong things about Christ, then you're putting your faith in the wrong Christ, which is to say one who doesn't exist. I think before we move on from priests, it's, and I think we, you should definitely go and watch your video series, people out there. But that word priest, that's another one that carries a ton of baggage in English. And we think of like, you know, if we think of a priest of Isis or a priest of um, Zeus or something, they were not at all equivalent to what a priest was or even what a priest was called in the early church, if I'm not mistaken. Well, that's true. I mean, the early Christians would not have used the same uh, word for priest, especially in Latin, that would describe a, you know, a Greco-Roman or a pagan priest. Um but there is a sense in which, you know, it's still legitimate to translate um, the, the, the word that they did use, uh, presbyteros or presbyter. You can still translate that as priest in our context because really what it's all about is this is the person who presides over the mysteries, right? This is the person who presides over the liturgy and the sacraments. And so there, there is a kind of affinity with you know, what the priesthoods would do in other religions as well. Um, so in that sense, the, um, you know, any, anyone who presided over the sacraments in the early church fulfills a priestly role. Now, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we get that from the pagans. We get it from our Jewish brothers and sisters, right? We get that from the Old Testament and the, the priesthoods of the Old Testament. That's really where it comes from. Now, the, the, the last of the big um, clerical offices, the deacon, that one's mentioned pretty early, and it, it seems to have a, a defined job title fairly early. What was a deacon, and did that deacon role have any, any sort of analogies to either Jewish worship or other greater Greco-Roman job titles? Well, yeah, that's a good question. And I have to admit, I mean, I'm not an expert on Jewish worship, so I, I can't think of any connections there. But it, it is interesting how in the book of Acts, very early on, um, you know, someone says, you know, we we got to have deacons. And they don't really explain, like, where they came up with that idea. But um, the deacons from the very beginning were assistants to the presiders. So, um when, you know, if, 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 if it's the bishop who is presiding over the sacraments, then the deacon is the assistant to the bishop. If, if the bishop delegates authority to preside to a priest, then the deacon will assist the priest. Um, but it's never, in the early church, it's never really this clear-cut three-tier hierarchy of bishop, priest, and deacon. I mean, we kind of think of it that way, but you even have times when deacons get elected bishop without having been a priest first. Um, so it's not that clear cut, but the, the job description of a deacon was to assist in both liturgy and also in what we would call pastoral care, right? So um, if, if you were in a city with a lot of people, especially if there were a lot of Christians and the bishop could not 
necessarily have a handle on what's going on with, with everybody in the church in that city. It was the deacon's job to, you know, do home visitations, find out who's in need, distribute resources, um, bring messages back to the bishop about who's struggling, visit the sick. And, um, and then you have the development of the deaconess so that uh, there could be a woman who could visit a sick woman or a woman who could um, assist in the baptism of another woman. And so you have the office of deaconess develops as well. And now a word from our sponsors. I always like to ask scholars and academics this question. Is there a topic in the early church that's really exciting you right now or that's like really you get out of the bed in the morning and you just want to start researching this topic? Is there something fresh out there that's really or that's, you know, exciting in the field? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I'm excited about doing these videos because I'm, I'm able to get back to basics in some ways. And I think if there's, if there's anything that, you know, kind of, you know, makes me jump out of bed, it's like, I feel like I'm doing some myth busting here. Like there are a lot of myths out there about the early church. And I get a chance to bring the evidence out into the light and, and bust a lot of these myths. Um, And, uh, but, you know, as far as, you know, specific topics, I'm, I'm always excited about Christology. I'm always excited about how the early church understood the person of Jesus Christ in his humanity and his divinity and, um, and how they articulated that. Because I think a lot of people sort of throw their hands up as though, well, it's just too hard to understand, let alone talk about it. And I don't think that's true. I mean, you know, it's a mystery. The Trinity is a mystery. Jesus Christ in his two natures. Yes, it's a mystery, but but not so much that we can't talk about it and learn about it and even understand it to a certain point. So I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, anybody can understand the Trinity to a certain extent um, so that they don't have to just sort of give up on, on uh, you know, as, as Augustine would say, or as, as Anselm would say, you know, faith seeking understanding, right? I think that ties in really well to some of the things you've talked about with translation, like in Jesus refers to himself as the son of man or the son of Adam, and then he refers to himself as the son of God. And I think you had mentioned something about this, and I had been reading about the son of man, and that had a very specific meaning. And he was saying that in a way, it was assumed that the person who was hearing that son of man or that son of God knew what he was talking about. Well, what was the, maybe the word he was using and how, what did that mean to the actual people? Yeah. You know, I mean, some people will say, well, Jesus didn't go around saying he was the Messiah and he, no, he didn't tend to use that word because most people expected a Messiah who was going to be a military leader and, you know, try to, um, start a revolution and everything. So he didn't say it, but, but what he did say is he repeatedly called himself or referred to himself as the son of man. And he knew that any Jewish person hearing this would immediately think of Daniel seven thirteen. So in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, Daniel has this vision where he sees the Messiah, the, the one who comes from God. And he says, I saw one like a son of man. So, you know, there's no question about this. When Jesus calls himself the son of man, that's code for Messiah. He's saying, when he calls himself the son of man, he absolutely wants you to think of Daniel chapter seven. And and so anyone would get that. Now, whether they choose to believe that that's who he is, is another thing, but they would would understand what he meant, that he was going to be this, you know, this, this figure uh, whom God had promised to send. And uh, so that's the connection. And, you know, in, in my latest video, how to choose a Bible, one of the things I talk about is, you know, I get very impatient with some of these, some of these Bible translations that, that um, obscure this, you, you know, where the, the term son of man is, is uh, translated as human being. It's sort of like, well, yeah, it sort of means that, but you're missing the whole point. And it obscures the connection that Jesus himself was making about his own self-identity with the Old Testament. So 
Um, yeah. With that person in the, the first century CE, hearing that word son of man and Messiah necessarily connect that with divinity, that that per that the, the Messiah is a divine entity or. Yeah. I think if they, if they were willing to see it, they would um, because not, you know, in Daniel, in that prophecy, you have this aspect of, of this one, like a son of man who is human, but, but more than human, he comes from the ancient of days. He, so there's a, there's a sense in which he sort of pre-exists right? The, you know, the rest of us or whatever. Um, and he, uh, he, he seems to, you know, come from the divine court. Well, then moving on from there, between the time of Daniel and the time of Jesus, you have other messianic writings that are not actually in the Old Testament, but that even go further to present this, this son of man, this Messiah figure as a divine being. And so, Um, Now, you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, I think Jews might be reluctant to to get uh, completely on board with it because, you know, they'd be afraid of compromising their monotheism. Well, well, there can only be one God. So if this guy is God, does that make two? What does that mean? And, And it took the church a couple hundred years to sort out the definition of the doctrine of the Trinity as an answer to that question. Um, so, you know, you can, you can see it in the disciples themselves. Uh, sometimes they're willing to get down and take a knee and worship him. Other times they're like, yeah, who is this guy? So, um, it was, it was a struggle for them to believe, but yeah, I do think that there is, there is a, a divinity built into the concept if, if one wanted to see it. I love this, um, talk about like debunking language things and i hate to use the word debunking in fact i'm going to call myth busting i think that that's a better term more charitable term is there any other things like that where it's they're using a figurative language that later translators take literally that kind of obscures what the what the meaning was that was intended and what they probably understood in the early church like ones that really stick out to you well, I mean, you know, the one of the most obvious ones is um, the biblical text where, where Jesus says uh, to call no one father. And then we get Protestants telling us, well, you call your priest father, so you obviously haven't read the Bible or you're ignoring Jesus's commands. And, and um, you know, I, I talk about this in my videos, but I mean, it's, it's clear that Jesus was using a figure of speech there. Um, so just like he doesn't really want you to cut off your hands or pluck out your eyes or anything, you know, he, he's making a point, but the early Christians, they, they did call their bishops father and, and their priests father. And so um, either they were ignoring Jesus's command or they understood how he meant it. Um, And they understood that he was sort of, you know, exaggerating to make a point. Um, But that's, you know, that's a, that's another really good case of people who read the New Testament and try to interpret it apart from the context in when it was written and first interpreted. So, you know, I'm I'm always saying you really can't understand the New Testament without understanding the early church because the, 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 the early church is the context for the New Testament. And you really can't, you know, go from the end of the first century and skip over the next 1500 years and expect to understand the Bible. It, you can't do it because you're you're skipping over all the people who interpreted the Bible who knew how to do it better because they were closer to the source. Um, again, you know, not that we have to come to all the same conclusions they did or apply scripture in all the same ways they did, but you have to take that stuff into account. Yeah, it sure seems that if you ignore that context then you're kind of missing a lot of the point and a lot of the, maybe the the richness that was built into that text, because so much of it comes from the context of the the day and the languages that they were using and analogy mixed with metaphors that it's not just a straightforward um, informational text because it could have been written in such a way, oh, this is, I mean, X, Y, and Z, and that's that. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, this is why I decided to call my my video series The Original Church, because, you know, we live in a world now where there's something like, I don't know, 40,000 different separated Christian groups now. Um, 
And, you know, you can throw in almost any Bible passage into the middle of that, and, you know, you'll get arguments over it. And so, you know, that just begs the question, well, then, you know, what did the original Christians do with this Bible passage? How did the original Christians interpret this? Not that they were always in 100% agreement, but there is consensus back there that we can um, that we can access and hold on to. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time. If people want to uh, learn more about your work and see your great video series, where can they find out more? The, the video series is on my YouTube channel, but um, there's a domain you can go to when the church was one.com and that's o n e at the end if, if you go to when the church was one.com that'll jump right to my youtube channel and the uh the series the original church is right there um and um if people are interested in my books you can go to drjimsbooks.com and that'll take you to my amazon author page yeah i think um i learned about your work i had seen a a uh, video on youtube of a lecture and you described Christology and you used two great metaphors that have always stuck with me. One about uh, oil and vinegar, and that kind of reached into my Italian American heritage of Christology, which I thought that that was great. And then the uh, Christology of the horse suit, where there's a person in the front and in the back. And I thought those were just great, great ways to visualize a really complicated topic. Yeah, that would be for Nestorianism, right? The heresy of Nestorianism. Jesus is like two men in a horse suit. <laughs> Which it makes really, I mean, it's two separate things in one. Yeah, yeah, that's thing. right. I mean, that's awesome. I want to thank you. And I, I've used up a lot of your time, but um, if people want, if ha they have further questions, I would definitely suggest they watch your videos and um, uh, email you or contact you because it's, it's incredible, and you've been a font of knowledge, and you've been very charitable with your time, to say the least. Oh, it's my pleasure. I love talking about this stuff, as you can probably tell from my videos. So uh, it's uh, it's always a blessing. So you know, hope we can do it again. <laughs>